What is up, down, and sideways, you beautiful individuals? Welcome back. It is League Online here, and Mark here with you beauties for a whew, jam-packed weekend. You know, this first round of LEC playoffs, they are just rapid-fire squads playing twice already on the Rift. Not best of fives yet, but best of threes. And Mark, we headed into this weekend after... What's happened at MSI and the EWC, we said, okay, we need EU as a region to get a little bit of a level up. So let's see it. SK, BDS, the top two seeds from the regular season. Let's see something good, something exciting for you to raise up the region. And after weekend number one, what are we left with? A G2 Fnatic matchup in winners. And we start with the G2 side of things because you're at least feeling... A little bit better about them. We fully expected them to come back online in playoffs. This new 80 carry mid lane meta is just a playground for caps. I'm calling it. It's the Elden Ring DLC type weekend for the LEC. You've played the whole game. You went through everything. You felt good. You were hoping for the best heading into the next content. You hit that DLC and you got smacked down by that first boss. And that's exactly how I'm feeling about almost, almost everybody in the LEC. They all went up against that boss. They all got flattened right away is unfortunately the takeaway from this very first week. We didn't see a lot of that traction, a lot of the successes that we wanted to see from these teams in the LEC to show that improvement, to show that edge, show that sharp tooth to the rest of the world. Not exactly what we saw this weekend. Maybe, maybe a, gl a glint off of the teeth of G2, but everybody knows all about that one. Yeah, I mean, that's honestly the least surprising result to see in G2 level up a little bit uh, in playoffs. Caps, I he hasn't even really leveled up. He's been at this level for like a full year now, but the Lucian and he's 9-1 on Tristana in his last 10 games, and somehow... He still gets through a pick ban and is able to pick this champion, who, by the way, I've heard multiple people say is probably the most broken champion in the game. So you let the most broken champion in the game go to the best player in the region multiple series in a row. Interesting strategy. You can add my name to that list. I'm calling Tristana the broken champ, most broken champion we've got in League of Legends right now. The type of damage that she offers, the play style, the safety, the aggression that is all there and balanced within that champion and how she's able to exploit it. Absolutely. In the most broken, most top level state right now. And someone like Caps piloting it, that is the most scary option to provide for G2. Unfortunately, it happens this weekend. And fortunately for us as fans, we get to see it and get to see that treat coming through. And that is where you get to see G2 flex a little bit and give you some of that, maybe some of those good feelings about the LEC, which unfortunately was pretty much the only team generating those good feelings about the LEC. And aside from Caps, obviously there was some great team fighting team play out of G2. They had some wombo combos. You had two incredibly polarizing games for Broken Blade as he showcased the brokenness of Aatrox or at least lethality when it comes to drain tanking and then he proceeds to get absolutely camped go 0-3 against a Malphite out of Adam and he's down like 40 CS in the Jace Malphite matchup and it just doesn't matter even with a triple AD comp the Malphite just doesn't do anything it never, never came to fruition is the unfortunate, most unfortunate thing of that Malphite because yes, you won everything you could individually. It never amounted to anything for the squad was the unfortunate reality for Adam. This series was one of those ones where we challenged BDS to take advantage of a G2 that wasn't necessarily, you know, again, wasn't out there flexing, wasn't out there showing it out. You gave him opportunities. You gave him the tool to do so as far as the Tristana for Caps, a specific pick. This was not what we were asking for this weekend to get that resounding fight back, that pushback, that fire from the rest of the LEC. This was not it. BDS barely even got to the G2 matchup, struggling past Mad Lions Koi, who if they don't throw a couple times, we're talking about them in the matchup against G2. So... BDS definitely not delivering in their first weekend of action. G2 was definitely more clean than the other old god getting to winner's finals. Obviously, we have 
followed this trajectory of Fanatic as they slumped into playoffs, slumped through EWC, and slumped through even getting to the matchup against G2 because it was a messy series against Giant X to start things up. And they were definitely more clean against SK, but more specifically in this series, you just you thank Noah for carrying you through and you salute to Irrelevant who tried his damnedest to keep SK going. Oh, man. This is a yucky one to touch as even both of these squads what they had this week and starting with i guess the more positive is fanatic the squad that is getting the victory is moving on type of thing there is a lot of head scratching still you're right about you know you get a little bit uh maybe slightly hovering that thumbs up for noah in the bottom lane specifically and in, in his contribution you've got a lot of head scratching going on about two of your most important players in fanatic in razork in the jungle and humanoid i think their trajectory and what we have seen from them well we were at the very highest of highs talking about what they were able to do and the type of power that they could lead fanatic to and all of a sudden it's gone it's not there it is not happening for razork individually some of these choices that he's making in the jungle and the individual execution off a humanoid is even more questionable what we've seen these last two three weeks really uh as a, as a whole when we're going through this play not good not good and, and i think humanoid is kind of your forgiving or it's hidden a little bit in that sk series because niski had his two worst games that he's had the entire split no it, it was not helped by niski having those performances either and this was one of those things Again, like BDS, that was the challenge issued for SK. Can you rise up? Can you put down a struggling Fnatic team that isn't on, you know, all sorts together? Can you take advantage of that and show power? Show that flex that, you know, that you've gone through all these, all these weeks throughout this split? And it all comes crashing down once again. SK showing zero power in the playoffs. And obviously, both SK and BDS, they're going to have the opportunity in losers to leave us with a better taste from this split. But again, just so disappointing how much we highlighted uh, the potential. And SK even looked clean 2-0 against Heretics. I was sitting there going, okay, a slumping fanatic that barely even got through to this next round. Let's showcase why you were the top seed in the regular season. And they fall completely Flat. I don't know if it's a mental thing, if it was picked bad for them, but absolutely that series I'm left less so feeling good about Fnatic and more just disappointed in the level we got out of SK. It's disappointing for SK and BDS because these are the two, again, Fnatic and G2, the standard that you are held up against for success, for being an international challenger from the LEC. And, uh, you know, knowing that, okay, if that's the standard, well, this Fnatic, this G2, I don't know if they're quite necessarily at their standard. Is someone going to usurp it and be at that standard for the, the European region? SK and BDS, this was your opportunity to give us that answer, to say yes. We're coming away saying anything but yes about this weekend. And listen, G2 is always the most exciting LEC team to watch. We love seeing them. But if they just roll through the third straight split uh, to win a title, it's it's becoming a bit of a joke to even have these regular seasons. They need to have that pushback. They need that fight. And as you said, it does become a little bit of a joke. Even when you go through all these eras, these periods of dominance from various teams across different regions, there was always a challenger. There was somebody, at the very least, two, uh, you know, even two squads in their own region that are challenging them, that are a difficult put out. There is strategy involved. And for G2, there almost doesn't seem to be that requirement from the rest of the LEC. This weekend, SK, BDS, both of them not showing a level close to what we got from G2. And that G2 level isn't even up to the G2 level of old. It feels like it's been almost a year since you were actually concerned G2 was going to lose a best of series. Definitely did not get that feeling uh, this weekend after a pair of two zeros. Outside of the LEC, we also had a classic marquee matchup. Doesn't matter what the standings are looking like whenever Gen G 
and D-plus or Dom Juan, whatever rename they've had over the years. These two always deliver, and it was the same case as always on Saturday. But unfortunately for D-plus, and I've seen a lot of people saying, yeah, see, D-plus is trash. They're not actually a top-tier LCK team. Another 2-0. But this just feels like the immovable object that is Gen G because you go up 10 to 2 in kills, you have all this momentum. Feels like the gold lead should be bigger than it is. But D Plus does everything right. Everyone's gonna try this Baron 10 times out of 10, and a 5v3 with an insane shuffle out of Chovy. Gen G's just too good. Like, I, what are you supposed to do? I swear, they're, they're a as seen on TV product is the only way I can describe Gen G because they do everything. It's a miracle product, man. How are they able to do this week in and week out? Every game, you're coming away feeling even better about this Gen G team. The big, uh, the big show dogs, of course. This uh, most recent addition is ya boy Chovy in the mid lane. We were talking all sorts of things about Canyon, about Keen. Heck, we were stopping down in the bottom lane talking about Pays, talking about Pays in the hands, the duo, and what they were able to do. For me, this game, this series, big time Chovy performances. I think he had 290 CS on his ear at 24 minutes. Uh, right before he's doing this shuffle. Like, it's just absolutely ludicrous. And talk about how boring the Tristana Corky meta is. I'm sitting here seeing Chovy pick a Zier and go, nice. And a no. Zier pick in the mid lane. Uh, <laughs> I told me some Azir, but he cannot be this refreshing pick that we're getting. Azir is anything. But refreshing for a meta, that is certainly a statement on where we are right now that we've gone all the way around where he creeps back in and it's going, oh, wow, Azir, hey, we're seeing you at the party. Yeah. But you see the Azir, the way Chovy's playing it, that thing's always invited to the party, my man. Top of the table in terms of most lethal Azirs on the planet right now. It was definitely a series to highlight him. Uh, uh, the first game was a little less close. Well, it was back and forth. Both games were back and forth for sure. But Genji, you felt like they were always kind of in control in that first game. Some sus positioning moments out of aiming on the Zeri in the game one. Maybe he plays that a little cleaner and uh, D-plus has a better angle to win. Yes, but I think at this point, and especially at this point in Aiming's career, you got to understand that's what you're you're getting with him on your squad. You are taking that risk that one of these moments happens. And unfortunately, it happens in a Gen G game, one of the ones that you want to obviously avoid it. But maybe this is, you know, you're cashing this one in and going a couple of weeks without it type of situation for D plus key. I think one of the important things to check in with for this series is Lucid in the jungle for D plus key. I think that he was he was okay, but it was more so just one of these things where he has been so good and he has been developing so well for D plus Kia. He gets that checkmate from Canyon to go, yeah, you still got uh, some room to go, my, my brother. Well, he does the Canyon with the ultimate flex, right? We're always criticizing these diddly picks on comps that have no lane priority, no CC to set up. We got a Cassante and an Azir, and Canyon says, I don't care. I'm picking Nidalee. And I'm going to take over the game. And I mean, he maybe didn't take over the game like we're accustomed to seeing him on an Italy pick. But I feel confident in him taking that champion. Doesn't matter what the other four champs are in a pick ban. If anyone in this world has earned that buy, has earned that safety net of, of taking your champion, it's Canyon. Canyon can pick whatever he likes here. And then in Italy, personal expression, personal choice. Certainly, I don't think the most optimal of options you could have rolled through in this composition. Optimal was not necessary on the day for Gen G, even though we did get some optimal gameplay from your boy Chovy in the mid lane is the one to highlight from this series. And now we're getting to just about the halfway point in the LCK regular season, and we can start talking, when is Gen G gonna lose? Not only are they 8-0, we're talking a perfect 16-0 overall game score. They have 2-0'd every single matchup so far in some. I'm saying never is going to be my answer early into this summer situation. you got to find second, KT Rolster on the schedule. You know that's where it's coming. And the second is going to be if it comes through. I don't even think it's going to be from one of these challenges from a T1, from a Hanwha Light, from a D plus Kia. Heck, 
as you said, even the Dark Horse KT Rollster lurking around, you know, maybe a Kwong Dong Freaks hanging in those murky playoff tier waters. It's not going to be them. It's going to be something wild. It's going to be a Fear X. It's going to be your boys at the OK Bros that are going to find a way to get a fluke against these Gen G boys because they have been so good, unflappable, uh, so uh, unmistakably good. You have to roll with them and you have to believe in that perfection is possible for this team. Buckle up for what at that point will be a 10-0 Gen G versus a 0-10 bro. And that's when you know that it's the breaking of the goose eggs on both ends with a crazy upset there. But yeah, we're already keeping track of this already historic summer split that Gen G is putting up in the LCK. Lots of big LPL matchups over the weekend as we're fully into this rumble stage of action over in China. And we had a top of the table throwdown, anyone's legend versus JDG. Wanted to see AL finally tested against one of the best teams in the LPL. They end up losing in three games, but it was absolutely a competitive series. And you can see that AL is there to compete with the top three teams in the LPL. They are, without question to me, a top five team in the LPL right now and what we have seen from them. And the answer here was really that test about where is JDG going to find themselves in that top five picture? And where are you, anyone's legend? Are you really just going to be relegated down to, okay, you got into the top five, that's it. Or are you going to be able to do damage in this top five? Are you going to be able to shake things up? That's the question for me from this series. The answers are relatively good because for JDG, you get the answer of yes, it is everybody been yelling all this time and they were right. Sheer in the top side is the angle, is that X factor that we need to be one of these better teams, to be better than just, you know, a fifth, a fourth in the LPL to knock into that top three and shake it up. That is where you're at with Sheer in the top side. He's his skill, his expression, all those things come through and allow JDG to play at that type of level. And if you're anyone's legend, my man, you were there. You hung in this series. You are at this type of level. And I think now you need to take a step away and, and kind of build yourselves up in your own minds and say, yeah, we are an elite level team in the LPL. We do belong to hang around with these type of teams. Let's get another opportunity. I know we're going to succeed. And, um, you know, for JDG, obviously, Yagao had a bit of a shaky series. Shanks was pretty solid throughout, but we did get to see some vintage ruler Ezreal plays throughout, even though he got caught a couple of times. That's also vintage ruler. You take him 1v9 in a team fight to die farming in the mid lane all by himself. So actually feeling a bit better about JDG after this series because I think the momentum seemed to be shifting towards anyone legend. So JDG kind of putting themselves back in that number three spot on the LPL, maybe even number two, because all of a sudden, top esports are sitting at zero and two as we continue along the summer redemption arc for Scout and the boys on LNG with a, I mean, a back and forth, but a 2-0, nonetheless, of the finalists from the EWC, and LNG are unironically looking pretty good. Oh, baby, this is getting a little scary for top esports. I was feeling so good, so confident. Coming off of the EWC, coming off of the MSI stretch until we hit a rough patch for this top esports squad. And the rough patch is hitting that mid lane and it's hitting top lane pretty darn hard for your boys Cream and your man 369 up in that top side. Extremely rough performances from the individual, uh, both of them leading to this downfall of top esports in the most recent matchup it, it that kind of left over and felt like jackie love and mako were trying to do too much to maybe make up for those guys because they're going all in level one before the wave has even hit flashing forward trying to get kills a little bit too psychotic of gameplay out of the bot lane and yeah maybe that is stepping up but it's strange that tien is like at the bottom of the list of guys you're concerned about right now He's he's unnoticeable with this top esports squad because you're not seeing anything crazy mistake wise or you know what is he doing or whatever, but you're also not getting any of this. Oh man, there it is. That's my Tian. That's that guy. He set me set it up perfectly. 
So there is some questions for this top esports team and exactly what's going on and why the performance has dipped down individually. Cream and 369 are two guys from this series that I think had the roughest of times and are two that need to be strong points for this top esports team. Now that we've gotten away from this, you know, the whole fearless draft segment that was going to be this early part of the LPL, and now we are in this locked in, you're with, you know, quote unquote here because yes, a couple of them get through from that first segment, the top dogs of the LPL. And you're 0-2 to start it out. That is not the look you needed if you were top esports. It's definitely not the look you need for NIP, who are now one worse. Ooh. Chilling at 0-3 fully. Not just frauds, they're just bad now because the fraud label is being shedded by LNG. It's gone, and Weibo has almost got it off. Now, all of a sudden, we got Tarzan on Nidalee and Lilia popping off. This is a guy who was doing 600 damage a couple weeks ago. You know, at the amusement park of League of Legends, we got lots of rides and, you know, you can keep your stomach feeling contained on a couple of them. Even the even the most infamous KT Rolster Coaster, you're keeping your lunch down. I don't know if I'm keeping my lunch down on this NIP coaster right now, man. I got to I got to get off of this ride here. This fraud to not frauds to fraud to not fraud. This has been all over the place. And unfortunately, I think the ending destination is Fraudsville for NIP. Yeah, I think the I think the track might just go into the ocean and they're never to be heard of again because yeah, peaking you know a top four in spring after that back and forth, the wobbling uh, in anyone's legends group in the group stage, but right now there is not much redeeming gameplay out of anyone on NIP. Usually at least we go well, rookie's farming well, but he was getting gapped by Zhao Hu on Yone of all champions. Oh, that, that that's a bad look. I can understand the Lucian. Uh, Lucian, yeah, that falls in. That's, you know, uh, Shahu's, he's, he's done that top lane. He's done that mid lane. No problem. A little bit more of an issue when it is the Yone coming through from Shahu that's able to do that. 0-5 combined for TES and IP. Rough start in that rumble stage. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, a beautiful people. Thanks for hanging out. 